Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is the gospel lesson read before from Matthew 18, but if I were to preach on the whole text, we would be here until the 250th anniversary of this congregation. So I'm just going to emphasize verses 1 through 6. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Thus far, God's word. Greetings to you from Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, from our faculty, our staff, our Board of Regents, and especially from our students. We have a couple former ones up here with me who are preparing or have prepared to be pastors and deaconesses in the congregations of our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, who are doing mission work in partner churches and mission stations throughout the world and who are proclaiming Christ in word and in deed. It is good to be with you. I like church anniversaries. Pastor told you I'm a historian, so I like church anniversaries. But I always remind congregations when they trot out the dusty old historian to speak at these kinds of things that anniversaries are great not only for looking to the past but also to consider the future. That is to say looking to the past to see the faithfulness of God and then taking God at his promise that he will continue to be faithful to his church into what is an unknown and very likely a challenging future because you are God's church. Anniversaries will take a look at things like, you know, the events in world history, uh, remembering the organization of something like a university or whatever else, some kind of institution. But the church is different. The church is people. The people of God redeemed by Christ and called together, called, gathered, enlightened, and sanctified by his Holy Spirit. The church is a miracle, plain and simple. That it exists is God's work and it's God's miracle. And St. John's, 225 years old, is just that, a miracle. Now, Like I said, I'm a church historian. So they trot out the dusty old church historian on anniversary occasions. And lately, I've been doing 175. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in Clifty near Columbus, Indiana, and they had celebrated their 175th anniversary. And we had a grand time, wonderful congregation, wonderful people, committed to the proclamation of the gospel, wonderful place, great times. About a year ago, I preached at Emanuel Lutheran Church in Frankentrost, Michigan, up by Saginaw, and they celebrated their 175th. And when we get together in those kind of places, you remember all the stories of the folks who came together, how they struggled, how they were striving to establish a faithful congregation, all the difficulties they went through, and then also all the joys as well. 175 years is a long time. And then there's St. John's. 225 is quite something. 
we pastors were comparing our notes up here. As I understand it, St. John's is the third oldest Missouri Synod congregation in existence. St. Matthew's in New York City has you by a couple of years. They were actually founded December, 20, uh, December 5th, 1664. But 1798 ain't bad. 225 years of God's faithfulness. It's a good time to reflect on this kind of text as we see Jesus rearranging the thinking of his disciples. He has to do that a lot because they have certain assumptions, they have certain hopes and dreams and the like, and today we get one of those places where they were off the mark. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What do you think they're really asking? I think they would probably personalize it a little bit more if they could. Am I the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Am I greater than at least these other guys who are following you? Surely there's some kind of comparison we can make. And Jesus, we want to hear it from you. Which one of us is the best? We know you're the best of all. But which one of us comes in second? We've heard it in other places in the uh, Gospels where the disciples come to him and say, Jesus, which one of us will sit at your right hand and which one of us will sit at your left? Now, of course, to sit at the right hand is the place of ultimate honor. And to sit at the left hand, not quite here, but nevertheless pretty good. But that's only two out of 12. Where are the rest going to sit? They all want to get a leg up. They all want to be a little better than their colleagues. And so Jesus has to completely rearrange their thinking. And how's it, how does he do it? He does it in what I find just to be an absolutely fascinating way. He takes the least important person in the area, at least humanly speaking, and he brings this child in and says, there's the greatest. There's the greatest. Now, can you imagine what the disciples are thinking? They wouldn't have the guts to say it. But can you imagine what they're thinking at this point? How is that possible? That kid hasn't done anything, anything at all. I have done all this. I've given up everything, Lord, and I've followed you. I've done far more than this child here who can't do a thing. And of course, that's Jesus' whole point to the disciples and to you and me. You didn't do a thing to make yourself special in the eyes of God. God loved you before you knew of God, before you knew him, and loved you completely unconditionally and said to you, you are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Makes no human sense. Paul in Romans chapter 13 tells us, give honor to those whom honor is due. Obey the government, that kind of thing. We all know how that works. We all know we have to pay taxes. None of us wants to. And yet here's Paul telling us, do it. These are the kinds of rules. These are the kinds of regulations that we need to keep our life in order. And into that, Jesus just blows the whole thing up. This child is the greatest. Maybe if you're old like I am, you remember a picture. I think it was uh, uh, Sonny Liston being beaten by Muhammad Ali. Anybody remember this picture? And there's Ali standing over this other boxer. And you can just see he's knocked him to the ground and he is victorious. And this, of course, is after Ali had been saying over and over again, I am the greatest, and he would continue to say what? I am the greatest. I am the greatest. 
it got very tiresome. I couldn't stand listening to the guy. That's all he ever said. And then what happened in his life? Parkinson's onset, tremendous struggles because of his success as a boxer, and a life that ended in utter and complete weakness, unable to do a thing. The Lord has a way of turning our normal human thinking on its head. And so he draws this child in the midst, into the midst of his disciples and says, here's what greatness looks like. It looks like this child. Now, Amy and I are grandparents, and our second grandson came along this year. And if you're grandparents or parents as well, you know that your grandchildren are the smartest, the cutest, and the best of all grandchildren. And if anybody disagrees about this with me, about my grandkids, we'll see, I'll see you over coffee or cookies and punch after the service. Right? We think they're the greatest. And rightfully so. Until we spend too much time with them. And then our mind changes. <laughs> or can change on occasion. Because kids are kids. And kids do kid things. And sometimes they're wonderfully surprising and delightful, and other times they just won't stop. Amy told me about the other night when our older grandson was digging for grubs and then, of course, wanted to eat them. You know, this is what kids do. How is this greatness? How could this possibly be greatness? And you know how it is? Because Jesus says it is. Here's a child... And the Lord says, he brings nothing. Instead, what? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Ask the disciples. And calling to him, Jesus put him in the midst of them. There's the whole change. Jesus called the child to him. And Jesus called you to him. And made you great not on the basis of anything you've done, but solely on the basis of his love, mercy, and grace. That's what Jesus does. I grew up in northern Illinois, and we lived in a suburb, I mean, the far west suburb of Chicago, I guess you'd call it that, uh, where in the, at the tail end of the baby boom, so there were kids everywhere in our neighborhood. And we could pull together a softball game at any time of any day, there were so many kids around. So we'd do it pretty regularly, play in the street, right? And we'd get the kids together, say, are we ready to go? We're ready to go. We got enough. All right. What's next? You had to choose up sides for the team. And so you pick a couple of people to be the captains of the team, and then you'd go through the folks remaining and choose you know, this guy, that girl, this person, on down the line. What did it mean to be chosen first? You were the best, the greatest, the most valuable to the team. What did it mean to be chosen last? We kind of get down to the end of the list of folks that were there, and we knew everybody's abilities, right? And you finally got to the point where you'd say, you know what? You can have the last two. Because having the other one, you know, might not actually help your team. You're better off with fewer players. Anyway, you get the point. And being kids, well, we were brutal with one another in our honesty. He can't play. He's not great. That's not how Jesus works. Instead, he did what? He chose you. Specifically, intentionally, purposefully. Jesus chose you to be his own. He chose you to be his child. To work with him in the kingdom of God. To be a part of his kingdom. To have the promise of eternal life. Jesus chose you because of you? No, because of his great love and mercy for you. Because he came 
as a child. And he lived the perfect life in your place. You know, we know quite a bit from the Gospels about the very early, not a lot, but, but enough from the very early part of Jesus' life, and we know quite a bit in the very last part of Jesus' life, last three years or so, but always folks want to know what happened in between. And we don't have details there. You know, story about him at age 12 popping up, that kind of thing. But what about when he's 22? We don't know. But what was he doing for you then? He was fulfilling God's law in your place for you because you couldn't keep it, because you wouldn't keep it. Jesus kept the law for you. And his entire life, from the time he came as that infant through the point of death on the cross, he perfectly kept God's law in every point, never failing once, so that the demands of the law would be fulfilled once and for all for you. That's what Jesus does. And in fulfilling that law, he raised the anger of the authorities, the religious authorities, and the secular authorities to the point that they determined to kill him and put him to death, even death on a cross, where he paid the penalty for your sin once and for all. Your sins, my sins, the world's sins, paid for completely. And then he rose the third day to open the doors of everlasting life to us. He did it all for you. And he has called you to himself. That's what Jesus does. And that's what he's done in this congregation from its inception. Before it was legally incorporated and they purchased land and there's a deed and all that stuff. The word of God dwelling richly in this congregation with faithful pastors proclaiming that word week in, week out. Delivering the gospel to the people of God. Forgiving you your sins and enabling you, emboldening you for service in his name to become Jesus speakers to a world that so desperately needs to hear of his love and his mercy. So they can hear, I choose you. That's what the Lord does. And his promise never changes. It doesn't waver in any way, shape, or form. So much so that the Lord, speaking in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 5, says this to us. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I, this is Jesus speaking, I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. Jesus acknowledging you. Jesus saying to the Father, this is your own dear child. This is your beloved daughter. This is your beloved son. That's what Jesus does. He's done it here 225 years. He'll keep doing it until his return. So I want to let you know that I will be available for preaching at your 250th. I'll be 85 at that point if the Lord doesn't come sooner or call me home before then. But I'm just trying to put pastor in a box here, you know. I, in all seriousness, who knows? Who knows what things will be like 25 years from now or 250 years from now. But this much we do know. The Lord never changes. And he is faithful. And he will continue to support, to encourage, to love, to forgive, and to bless his church, namely you. God bless you all, and what a wonderful celebration of 225 years. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, safeguard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.